thanks for coming. Uh, this is my talk entitled An Introduction to Spies in RSpec, and I think we'll get started. So I'm Sam Fiffin. Uh, I'm Sam Fiffin on Twitter and Sam Fiffin on GitHub. You can have a look at my various profiles on those sites if you want to. And if you do have a look at my GitHub profile, uh, you'll probably notice that I spend most of my time on GitHub working as a member of the RSpec core team. And that's sort of why I'm here giving this talk today, because to me, it's really important that RSpec is sort of represented in community events like this, and also that uh, we give introductions to beginners that enable them to more powerfully and quickly use the testing framework. So I hope that everyone goes away having learned something about RSpec today. I work for a company called Fun and Plausible Solutions. We're a sort of consulting agency for data science problems, which means that we tend to work with uh, companies that know how to build really great web and mobile applications, but don't necessarily know how to do things like machine learning or recommender systems or A-B testing and things of this ilk. And if you're trying to do those in your own work and you're struggling for whatever reason, please do come and have a chat with me after we're done, because I love talking about this stuff. Um, so I wanted to sort of preface this talk by saying that my sort of conceit for this talk is not for me to drop some grand position on software engineering or present my ideas for what we should be doing 10 years down the line, but instead sort of present an interesting slice of facts about testing and how RSpec works. And I'd much rather everyone in the room learn something than I get to the end of my talk. So if I say something that you find confusing or you'd like me to expand upon, I would ask you to interrupt me and ask a question, because more likely than not, if you have a question about something, someone else in the room will as well. So this talk is really about testing and how we actually go about testing our software in Ruby and the tools that we use to do it. And one thing that I find amazing when I work with people that use different programming languages. Like I work with a lot of people that do Python and Java and build apps for iOS and Android, is that the Ruby community is the community that has just embraced testing. They've really sort of engulfed it and accepted it into their everyday practice. And that's not the case with many of the other programming languages and communities. And to me, it's amazing that we do as much testing as we do, even at the beginner level. Because even if those tests aren't perfect, even if for whatever reason they have problems, it still means that I can walk up to someone's app that I've never seen before and begin confidently making changes without having to worry about what's going to happen as I do those changes and I'm going to break something. And I wanted to sort of provide my thoughts on why writing tests, why actually building automated testing for software is a really useful thing to do, or at least one perspective that you could take. And to me, this is really to do with um, mental models of how we write our software. So in the beginning, when you're working on an application, I would argue that it's entirely possible for you to hold nearly everything that your software is doing in your brain. And that means that it's really easy for you to make changes with confidence and adapt to the software that you're writing. But as time goes on and our product managers and our users come to us with feature requests or bug reports and we you know, make changes and grow our software, that becomes more and more complex. And our software begins to get sort of bent out of shape. And it becomes very difficult to hold everything that your software is doing in your brain. And to me, this is where the tests come in. They literally allow us to serialize knowledge about our application into an executable form. And I think this is one of the things that 
I often see beginners struggle with is actually a good impetus for why writing tests is useful. They understand sort of behavior verification and so on, but that doesn't seem to be a long-term goal. Once you've got the behavior written, that's it, right? Well, yes and no. And I think the just sort of test suites soaking up knowledge is really useful to have in the applications that we write. And I think that that knowledge, as it grows over time, allows your team to expand and allows you to continue to work with your software. It's also true that when you're writing tests alongside software together, so growing your software and your tests at the same time, you're able to find bugs in new features as you're developing them. And what that means is that you can build your feature and deliver it knowing that more likely than not, it's going to work when it's integrated with all of the others. And also, that all of the, those bugs that you encountered whilst you were developing your software are less likely to actually be present ever again in the future. If you just refresh a web browser every time you make a change to the software that you're writing, it's more likely that those things are going to come back. And perhaps more than this, when um, a bug in our software does make it all the way from us through our managers, through our QA, and all the way out to our users, if you write a test that demonstrates that bug and fails when that bug is present, and then you implement the fix to your software that allows you to actually verify that the bug is gone, you can be pretty certain that that bug is never going to come back. And I think that that's a really useful property to have when writing software. It's also true that we can write tests that actually help us improve the design of the software that we're writing. Some kinds of tests, when you write them, allow you to focus so deep on a single piece of code in your application that the natural result is that the actual design, the software architecture of the system that you're writing improves. And this is a really useful property to have when writing tests. But to talk about that in any detail, we need to talk about the kinds of tests that it's possible to write. And I wanted to start with the sort of test that I think most beginners write when they're thinking about how to test applications. And that's an integrated test. And the idea behind an integrated test is that you're going to take your entire application, your database, things that talk to the internet, email systems, Amazon access, whatever, and just box it up. And then you're gonna sort of interrogate that entire system as one piece, effectively interacting with your application as a user would, and faking no part of the world in which your application lives. And this kind of testing, this integrated testing, I think is really useful for certain kinds of behavior that we expect when writing systems. So it's generally true when you're writing integrated tests that if an integrated test fails, your application is definitely broken. And if it's passing, that means that your application might be working. And those sort of information keywords there are really important. The opposite end of the testing spectrum is an isolated test. And an isolated test takes a single piece of your application, a class or perhaps even an individual method, and isolates it from all of its dependencies and all of its collaborators and forces you to focus on the very specific implementation of just that piece of functionality. And in order to achieve isolated testing, you necessarily have to fake part of the world that that test is going to touch. A way to think about it is that when you're writing an isolated test, you're basically uh, hiding as much of your application as you can from that piece of code in order to be able to test it on its own. And isolated tests, due to their extremely focused nature, are what give us our ability to exert design pressure on the software that we're writing. Because if you find that it's difficult to write an isolated test, you'll generally find that the design of your system has some problem. The software architecture that you're working on 
is not as flexible as it might be. And the sort of intuitive explanation here uses the idea of coupling. If your component in your system is highly decoupled from the rest of your application, it's very easy to isolate it. And if it's highly coupled to random parts of your system, that's not the case. And that's sort of why isolated tests are useful. It's also true that you know, a spectrum of tests exist in between integrated and isolated tests. For example, if you're building an application that uses a service-oriented architecture, you could take a single service out of your application and test that on its own by faking the other services that it's going to talk to, but not faking any of the objects that are internal to that service. And that would be like a partially integrated and partially isolated test. But it's just to sort of demonstrate that there are a spectrum of isolations that you can apply to tests, and that's an example. But I wanted to sort of talk as well about the use of actually faking different components of our system, and to do so, I wanted to use um, an analogy that I've actually borrowed from Justin Searles, who's giving the closing keynote of this conference. He gave a talk about isolation in testing that I found quite useful. And the idea here is that let's imagine that we're building a GPS system for a new Boeing 747. Well, we could do an integrated test as we were building our GPS system. Literally put it in a plane and fly it and the plane like crashes because we wrote our GPS wrong. We do this again and again and again until our system works. But that's obviously going to be very expensive and slow and destroy a lot of planes. And like if we take that GPS unit and we isolate it, you know, we can test and get fairly confident that it's going to work before we put it in any plane whatsoever. And that's going to be a lot faster and a lot cheaper and a lot more useful. And we can sort of draw a parallel uh, in building computer systems, right, where um, you know, talking to a database server and an email server and Amazon is really kind of going to be expensive, right? And it's not going to work all of the time if your network is down for whatever reason or you're in a foreign country and your Wi-Fi isn't working and you can't have roaming. Um, anyway. <laughs> so yeah. Um, Let's talk about ways that we can actually fake different parts of our application and talk about how those are useful. And this is where we're going to deviate from sort of talking about testing in general um, and start talking about uh, RSpec in specifics. So um, in RSpec, and in fact some other testing frameworks, we have a concept of a stub. And the job of a stub is to take some object that our system collaborates with, uh, sorry, a component that we're isolating collaborates with, and fake out a response to one of that object's method calls. So what you're going to do with a stub is you're going to pick an arbitrary object that your object collaborates with and replace one of its methods with the stubbed implementation. And the idea with a stubbed implementation is that it's so simple that it allows you to not have to worry about the implementation of that collaborating object but instead just allows you to focus on the implementation of the object that you actually care about whilst ignoring that particular collaborator. Stubs are really useful for taking an object and isolating it, but they don't allow you to verify that any collaborations between objects actually happen. And it can be a desirable property to actually test that our objects are collaborating with each other, right? If my object depends on something else, I may want to verify that I'm actually calling that other object's methods. And to do that, you use what's called a mock. And mocks are very similar to stubs. They take the implementation of some method on another object, and they replace it with what's called a mocked implementation, whose job is to actually check that a call occurs and then cause the test to fail if no call is made. And so where stubs just merely allow you to isolate yourself from a dependency, Mocks allow you to verify that you're actually interacting with that dependency. And so now we should talk about spies. That's sort of what the title of this talk is about. And spies are different to stubs and mocks 
in that their job is not actually to replace the implementation of any individual method, but they are objects in, your own, in their own right. So when you're using a spy in your tests, you're actually creating a new object and then pushing that object into your test in a way that allows you to sort of isolate with your collaborators. And if all of those words didn't make all that much sense, don't worry, because now I'm going to do some live coding, <laughs> and hopefully it's going to go fine. <laughs> so, and let me just mirror my displays here. I think everyone should be able to read that. I ran to the back of the room and checked, but please holler if you can't. So, has anyone here never used RSpec before? Cool. Oh, that, that guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, this is a really simple, just like template RSpec test file. And all we're doing here is we're loading a file called spec helper via require. And the spec helper just sort of sets up some common defaults for our RSpec test suite. And then we're using uh, the describe method here to actually set up a group of tests. And we're going to write all of our tests inside this describe block to actually do some things. So let's have a look at how spies in RSpec actually operate. Then I'm going to move on to an example using an existing piece of code. And then I'm sort of going to wrap up and take questions and we can play with the technology. So, so it records method calls. So in RSpec, the way that you get a handle to a spy object is you just invoke the spy method anywhere in the body of your test. When you're writing tests in RSpec, you use this it method to create a new test, and then everything in here is actually the sort of body of our test. So I've got this handle to a spy object, which is called my spy. And the way that I set expectations that methods actually get called is with uh, some sort of normal RSpec syntax where we say expect my spy to have received foo. And what this line of code does is it will check all of the method calls that have been sent to the my spy object and see if any of them match the method name foo. And so if I run this test, it's going to fail. And the reason that the test has failed is that it says right here, uh, double dot foo any args expected one times with any arguments and received zero times with any arguments. So all I need to do to make this test pass is invoke my spy dot foo. And now if I run the test again, it's passing. So what's actually happened here is that when I've invoked the foo method on the spy object, it's recorded that that call has been made and then I'm actually checking which calls have been made here on this final line of the test. You can also match arguments um, when you're writing uh, tests with spies. So if I copy the body of this test and drop it in here, I can add this with uh, call to the have received call, which will actually validate the arguments get passed. So what I'm expecting now is that there will be an invocation of the foo method with the arguments one, two, and three. And if I execute this test, it will fail because it expected one, two, three, and it got no arguments. If I delete the call altogether, it will go back and say that it was expecting one times with that one, two, three argument list, but it was received zero times. But if I just add the call back and actually provide the correct argument list, that test will now pass. Finally, you can actually also check that method calls happen a specific number of times. So what I'm going to do is check that the method was received four times and then do it. Times the method was called. Let's just copy the body of this. And the way that you do that is with this uh, slightly sort of funky syntax where you say, exactly, and then a number, and then dot times. Uh, this, this is all just method chaining. So what's actually happening there is have to received creates an object, and then all of these calls are just calling back onto that same object. And so this test, as you would expect, it's going to fail because it was expecting to receive four times, and it only got it once. So if I copy this and paste it out, 
three, uh, four times, and then run the test, everything is now passing. So this is the basic things that you can do with spies. You can check which methods are being uh, called, you can match against arguments, and you can also validate that calls are being made uh, a certain number of times. So I'm now gonna move on to looking at a test for an actual piece of Ruby code. And so what I've done here is I've written an object called counter client. And the job of counter client is to provide an API wrapper around an extremely simple HTTP service that I've written, which stores uh, counts that are provided to string keys. And so what this is really doing is it's making HTTP requests out to like some external service and then sort of providing uh, responses to those. And so basically what I've got here is a set of integrated tests for my counter client, right? And so the behavior that it has is that if I don't increment a key at all and I call the get method on that key, I get the integer zero back. If I call increment once, and then I call the get method on that key, I get the integer one back. And finally, if I do this a random number of times, uh, I get that random number back. And so these three tests sort of provide all of the coverage that you need to actually validate that this object is correctly counting string keys. Um, just to prove to you that the implementation actually works, um, if I run my tests, they all pass for the counter client. And you can see here that the runtime is significantly higher, and it is actually making HTTP requests. Um, so one thing to note here, though, is that nothing about these tests actually dictates that HTTP requests are getting made. They're all do just doing simple interactions with the counter client object, and we don't actually have any proof that any kind of talking to the network is occurring. If we look at the actual implementation of the counter client object, we can see here that it's using this LHTTP thing to actually make HTTP requests uh, to the service base URL, which is just a hard coded uh, localhost 4567 string under the key. And then when we make that HTTP request, because the API returns the count as a string and like an HTTP response body, we need to convert that back to an integer to have the behavior that we actually want. So we sort of established that our existing set of tests don't actually validate that we're making HTTP requests. So let's do that for one of the methods using mocks, and then we'll do it with spies and see what the difference sort of is. So I'm actually just going to do describe get here. And this is a kind of RSpec idiom. When you're describing instance methods on individual objects, so when you're just testing an instance method on a particular object, in the string that you provide with the describe block, you typically do like the hashtag symbol and then the word get, or, or and then the word that is the same as the method. So, it calls the get method on the LHTP uh, client, right? That is what the behavior actually does, um, you can see here. So let's implement that. Um, and this is how you do a mock in RSpec. You say expect, and then the thing that you want to mock, to receive, and then the method name. And then I'm gonna do the argument here, which is HTTP localhost 4567 key. Um, one thing we do need to do is lift key up to the top level of the test. So our spec has this mechanism called let, which allows you to take common pieces of the test that you're writing and extract them so that you can reuse them without having to repeat yourself inside the individual tests. And I've currently caught this let inside the describe for the integration tests as opposed to describe for the entire class. So I'm just gonna move this up a level so that it becomes available to all of the tests in this file. And so now that key reference will uh, be the same as the value that I'm, I've got up here. I'm then gonna, just gonna call um, counterclient.getKey, and that should make 
the request, right? Because we're calling the method and that method collaborates with that object, we should be fine. Um, let's do that. Cool. And so the new test that we've just added is passing. That's useful, but I always think that it's a good idea to see a test that fails as well as a test that passes. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to uh, comment this line out and then go back to my tests and run them. And we can see here now that all of our tests are failing, but the one that uses the mock, the one that sets this expect to receive, is also failing. So we know that it's possible for that test to fail. We've seen it in both states. And so I'm sort of happy with that test now, and I'm going to move on by fixing the implementation. So we've sort of now verified using mocks that our object is collaborating with the HTTP client correctly by making the get request. But there's a couple of problems with this test that we've written. The first one is that the order of operations in this test is different to the order of operations in all of the other tests in this file. So if you, you look at this one above, there are three distinct steps, which I'll highlight here by pushing them apart. We have this sort of setup step where we actually generate the random number of calls that we're going to make. We have this action step where we're actually doing the calls. And then we have what's called the expectation step. We're actually checking that the state of our system is correct. And this is a sort of idiomatic test design pattern called a range act assert. And the idea is that if you cause all of your tests to follow this pattern, it becomes extremely obvious for other people to work out what your tests are describing and how they actually work. If you have those operations in any order, it can become much harder to understand what the test is actually doing. And so whilst this test above does follow that pattern, this test below doesn't. There's no sort of setup step, but that's fine because our setup step is basically to do nothing. But then we've got action and assertion the wrong way around, right? We have this assert step coming straight before our action step. And it's really common to see that when you're using mocks, because mocks set an expectation at the beginning of the test that an interaction will occur somewhere in the duration of the test. And the reason that that's kind of problematic is it breaks this arrange act assert pattern in a way that means it can be slightly harder to work out what your tests mean. And this is a trivial example, because we've only really got two lines in our test, and our client is really, really simple. But as you build more complex systems and your test becomes more complicated, this can cause a real pain. And so we can fix that using spies. The other problem that this test has is that it's running away and it's monkey patching a library that we don't have any control over. So LHTTP is a random constant that is provided to us by that library and is not something that we you know, really wrote or have any ownership of the API of. And generally speaking, it's a bad idea to sort of change the implementation of things that you don't control. So this sort of leads me to want to make some changes to the design of both the counter client and the test that we're writing. And so let's go ahead and do that. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to create a new let called HTTP which up here will just reference the LHTTP constant. And we're actually going to pass that into the counter client. And then in the implementation of counter client, we're going to change the constructor. Oh. Um, uh, to actually take the past HTTP client in. And then we're going to change the implementation of this HTTP client method to just return the instance variable of the passed in HTTP client. If we go back to our tests and run them all, they should all still pass. And this is an example of an extremely small refactoring we've made that will allow us to improve the design of our tests in just a second. So, what? Oh, thank you. Typing is hard. Um, great, all of our tests are passing. Thank you, pair programmers in the audience. Um, so that's great. 
Because now what we can do is we can go down to this test and override the definition of HTTP to just be a new object. And now, when I do this, that just went ding. Object does not implement get. Oh. Um, let's use a double. Sorry, I screwed up. Um, so, doubles in RSpec are objects that allow you to take, just um, simply give them a dictionary of keys to values, and they will just implement stubs on themselves that implement those methods. So what we've got here is uh, a simple double object, which just implements get returns nil, and then we should be able to expect on that. And again, all of our tests are passing. But now, because we're at a state where we can actually provide anything in place of the HTTP client and write our tests in any order, we can use a spy to get back to that arrange, act, assert model for our tests. And so I'm going to replace the use of a double here with a spy. And then I'm going to move this down here to say expect HTTP to have received get with that argument. Now, this is going to work because spies respond to all methods when you pass them uh, into your test, and then you set expectations afterwards. So if I run this, then you're like, it will pass. And so now what we've got in our test is much better, right? Because we're not reaching onto the L HTTP object and replacing the implementation of one of its methods. And we haven't got our test out of order. We're following this arrange act assert pattern that allows us to simply and obviously have a structure for our tests. And so that's sort of all of the code that I had to write directly. Um, I'm going to tab back to my slides for just a moment, um, and then I'll take sort of finishing questions. So as you might have been able to pick up from my accent, I'm not really from these parts. Um, I am, in fact, actually British, or as my friend that lives in Boston likes to say, really British. Um, it's quite a ways to come. Really, really tired. Woke up at 5 a.m. this morning. Um, and I have one small rant that I have to deliver as a British person to a room full of Americans. And it's to do with the quality of the tea in this country. <laughs> so I really like tea. I think tea is a really good way to relax, calm down, etc. But I cannot, for the life of me, get a good cup of tea in this country. And, and like, so some of my friends who I was visiting in Atlanta before I came to this conference took me to a tea place there. And like, it's a professional tea place. And it gave me bad tea. So, so the reason, I, I have, I actually, I understand the reason. It's to do with how you prepare water for your hot beverages in this country, because nearly everyone drinks coffee. And the ideal temperature to prepare coffee at is about 92 to 95 degrees centigrade. For tea, the water has to be boiling when it hits the tea bag. And so Americans, if you do nothing else, if you have learned nothing from this talk, <laughs> learn to boil your water properly when you put it in your tea. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone ha some people have questions. I don't care. <laughs> the question was, what about tea at a higher elevation? Sorry, yes? What? Ah, is that a real question? Right, give me a second, and then I'll, I'll be back. RSpec 3 was released about two or three months ago. It's the new major version of RSpec, and that means it has breaking changes. And I know that sounds scary, because like your test suites are the lifebloods of your applications, right? I think. Everyone would be fair to say that they couldn't confidently delete their test suite today and be happy to continue working on their applications. And similarly, doing a major version upgrade is scary. There's a really good upgrade process for RSpec 3 that many people don't know about because it's not very obnoxious and in your face. 
I would highly encourage you to look for the R spec upgrade guide on the internet because it will make your life easy and there are automated tools to help you. Um, okay, now I, now I really am honestly done. Um, I'm Sam Fippin on Twitter and GitHub. My email address is sam at funandplausible.com if you want to talk more and you can't find me at the conference. Thank you very much for listening to me rant at you. Um, let's have, oh, you guys. Um.